Well, good evening, family. It's Dr. Wilson, and welcome to another window to look through. It is Wednesday evening live right here at the Angelos Biblical Institute. And tonight we're going to be studying for our Bible class, the gospel according to Mark. Mark's gospel, chapter 14, looking at verses 32 through 42. That's Mark chapter 14, verses 32 through 42. And tonight I'm going to be talking from this topic. How to go through your Gethsemane. How to go through your Gethsemane. So if you would uh, log on, share this page with brothers and sisters, allow them to connect with you as we take this journey, I believe the Lord is going to bless you real good in our Bible study on tonight. Let me open us with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we do thank you tonight. For the ABI family, we thank you for this critical moment to study your word, to share one with another, to uh, walk through the biblical text, and to hear what the Spirit has to say to the believer. So God, teach us how to walk through those treacherous moments and spaces and places of difficulty. Help us to grow thereby and help us to learn of you as we take this journey be with our teacher, giving wisdom and insight and instruction. And God will give you all the honor and the glory for it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Thank God. Amen. Amen. Well, let's get right into it, beloved. The gospel according to Mark chapter 14, verse 32 through 42. The Bible says, then they came to a place which was named. Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John. They went with him. And he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. And then Jesus said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. And he went a little farther, and he fell on the ground. And he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you, so take this cup away from me, but nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. And then he came and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray unless you enter into temptation. For the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and he prayed and he spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them sleep again, for their eyes were heavy and they did not know what to answer him. Then he came the third time, and he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And all God's people said, amen. How to go through your Gethsemane. How to go through your Gethsemane. I want to thank you tonight for watching and logging on to this text. I pray that the Lord will meet you in a special way as we study this time together. Okay, let's do it. Family, it's in the last few hours 
before the crucifixion that the Lord had had holy communion with the disciples in the upper room. The new covenant had been proclaimed. And now the hour of bitterness is upon him. Jesus has just served his disciples notice that one of them is going to betray him and that they all will be scattered and will forsake him. However, first, they must go through Gethsemane. And I've come to realize something in my walk these 32 years, that there is some Gethsemane moments in life that are extremely hard to deal with. You see, sometimes the Christian journey is not filled with what we call pleasantries or it's not filled with the things that we think it should be filled with. I've come to understand that there are some things on this journey that the child of God simply has to endure because God has preordained them to be so. Can I get a witness right there? In fact, class, I'm thoroughly convinced tonight that after reading this text, more now than ever, that every child of God has to go through Gethsemane. Gethsemane, you know that place. That place where you are with others, but you are really walking alone. In today's text, we see a picture of what it means to be with God, serve with God, leading others with God, working in community, but yet having something hard to go through that just is ordained for you. This text, it helped me to see what it means to suffer in the mind, the soul, and the spirit because God has set you up. Can I turn the light on right here? Beloved, because of this study, I've learned not to rely on others to stay awake with you through your trial. Why, chaplain? Because every believer in the flesh can only do so much. Am I talking to you tonight? Beloved, this is a profound but bitter text. See, it's written that you and I might grow from it, learn from it, and discover just how we too have to go through our Gethsemane, our assignments. If we are truly going to keep living, we're going to truly face Gethsemane. So today, let's talk about what it looks like to go through your Gethsemane. How do you go through Gethsemane? Well, number one, you go through with a heart to pray. Number two, you go through going deeper in prayer. And then number three, you go through leaning on prayer. Let's unpack these as we walk through this text today. The Bible says in verse 32, that then they came to a place, a place which was named Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, you all sit here while I pray. Now, beloved, the first thing I notice in this text is that Jesus takes his disciples along with him to pray. And he takes them because he's getting ready to encounter a difficult task. Now, the place he traverses with them to is called Gethsemane. It's the oil press where the olive groves were growing. It's where they would bring the olives after they were collected from the trees and crush them. 
in order to provide substance for others. This place, Gethsemane, is symbolic tonight, beloved. It's symbolic because of what was getting ready to happen in the life of the Christ. Jesus enters the garden and he first posts a set of disciples to wait near the entrance while he prays. Now, I find this interesting that Jesus doesn't invite the others to pray with him in this situation. No, the text doesn't say that. I believe he wants to be alone with his fathers. So he asks the others to go along with him, but he's going to go and communicate, commune with the father in private. Look at the text. The Bible says in verse 32, after they get to Gethsemane, and he took, you see it there? Peter, James, and John. And he took them with him, and he began, here it is, to be troubled and deeply distressed. Verse 34. Then he said to them, my soul, is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Peter, James, and John, stay here and watch. It's a beautiful picture here. Let me unpack it. The first thing we see is that Jesus began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Jesus in his humanity was experiencing what we call terrified amazement. It, it is experiencing what some theologians mark as the dark night of the soul. It, it's that mental and psychological anguish that happens to you when you are going through a horrific trial. Jesus said this, my soul, good God Almighty, is sorrowful unto death. Let me explain this. Jesus' soul here was so filled with sorrow that it was threatening his life until he was near death at that moment. In other words, it's like saying, I feel the weight of this. I, I'm about to die. In Luke 22, Luke says he was sweating great drops of blood. That that's the anguish that was upon him. Well, what was happening, chaplain? I'm glad you asked. He was receiving from the father the cup of sorrows. What cup? It was the cup he had to drink in order to save you and I from sin. Now, beloved, there's three things happening in this one verse. Number one, we see Gethsemane was in full effect. It was the place of crushing. Number two, we see that Jesus is troubled is from God, his Father. Number three, we see that his crushing was for our salvation. Can I turn the light on right here? Beloved, there are some cups of sorrow in life that God leads the believer to drink. There are some cups of sorrow in life that have your specific name on it. What do you mean, Wilson? Paul says that all those who will live godly shall suffer persecution. And here we see Jesus going through that very same suffering. Third thing I notice in this passage is there are some cups of bitterness that have been preordained by God and no matter whom you are 
or what you've accomplished, you are called to go through them. Can I get a witness right there? Well, we've looked at how to go through your Gethsemane. First, you got to go with a mind to pray. Secondly, let me show you now how to go through your Gethsemane. Go deeper than normal when you pray. Look at the text. The Bible says in verse 35, he went a little farther after he just talked to Peter, James, and John, and he fell on the ground and he prayed. He prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, Daddy, Father, all these things, or all things rather, are possible for you. So take this cup away from me. But nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Now notice this, family. Here in this verse, we learn the secret to praying beyond our human limits. Mm -hmm. We can learn from the Christ to ask for what is best for us and what he wants us or what we need him to do beyond our physical needs. We can learn selflessness in this prayer. Oh, yes, we can. See, because Jesus prayed here often, he had a special place where he would meet with the Father. And this place of prayer was his sacred location where he encountered the Father's voice. Because of what he was about to endure, his passionate prayer for help was in order. When he prayed, the text says, he said, if it's possible, to let this hour pass, Father, let it pass from me. Lord Jesus, when I read this text, Jesus knew that this hour was the only way. It was what they had discussed in eternity past. He knew there was no other way we could be redeemed but by Calvary. And because of the cup of sorrows, his humanity was in agony. Remember, he is both 100% God and 100% man. Divinity and humanity. And the humanity of Christ was in agony. His flesh would ask the question, already knowing what the divinity answer was going to be. See, here it is. Sometimes during our sorrows, we too know that God has called us to suffer. Am I right right there? Sometimes during our sorrows, we understand why we're going through it, but it still doesn't make it easy. Sometimes, beloved, during our sorrows, the flesh will cry out because of the pain it's got to face. Sometimes, during our sorrows, the flesh will want to know if we can avoid the struggles that we are in. Sometime during our sorrows class, the flesh will reach for God in hopes that he has another way for us to glorify him. Let me say it like this. Why? Because the flesh does not want to die. It hates pain. It hates sorrow. It hates agony. It hates to experience what will make us better. Hear the words of the Lord in verse 36. He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. You can do it if you want to. That's what he's saying. So take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Here's what I noticed, class. In his prayer... Jesus is intimate in his conversation. He says to his father, Abba, father, which is an Aramaic term. It means daddy parent, right? Abba is an Aramaic word that denotes 
parental relations. Uh, father is the Greek word pater, and it denotes parental responsibility. He's saying, uh, Daddy, you're responsible. Take this cup from me. Jesus not only identifies who has parental authority over him in this manner, but he identifies who holds rep parental responsibility for all that he is and all that he's about to go through. What a beautiful picture of the relationship with the father and the son. Then I notice he communicates that as his daddy father, he can call him to drink the cup of sorrows. Yes, he could. And he knows and believes that God the Father can remove the cup just like he gave the cup. Anytime he was ready, he could have came with another way. However, Jesus asked to his prayer, Abba Father, but don't remove it because I want you to. Remove it because this was in the best interest of yourself. Good God Almighty. There are three divine ideas I see in this statement, class. Look what he says. Nevertheless, not what I will, but, Abba, what you will. Now here we have the sacrificial picture of the selflessness of Christ. Oh, yes, we do. Here we have the idea that God is all sufficient. He is all omniscient. Why? He knows what is best for us. Here we also see that Jesus knows that his father not only knows what's best, but Jesus knows what's best too. And in spite of the pain, he wanted what was best. Good God Almighty. Beloved, herein lays the challenge for the child of God on tonight. It's our challenge as we go through our Gethsemane experience because we all got one. Oh, yes, we do. We all got a Gethsemane. We need to align our hearts to have the mind of Christ. Beloved, we need to get to this point in our Christian journey where we can say like Jesus, Lord, if you want to take this cup, please take it. But if you don't, let your will be done. We too need to mature to the point where God's will is what's best for me. Not what I want is what's best for me. We need to get to this point where God's ways are what we desire. No matter the cost it may ask of us, the pain it may put us in. We too need to get to this point where God can train us to endure the sufferings of this whole world. We need to get to the point, class, where we begin to look like Jesus. We too need to get to this point where God molds us and shapes us into his image. And the only way we can get there is that when we go through our Gethsemane, go a little further in prayer. You catch it? What we've looked and how to go through Gethsemane by when you go through there, go to pray. Number two, how to get through the Gethsemane. When you go to pray, go a little further than you've gone before. Here's the third thing. When you get to Gethsemane, how you go through is go to pray, go a little further, but guide others that are there with you to do the same. Let's unpack it because it's here in the text. The Bible says in verse 37, that then he came. Who came? Jesus came. He got up from going a little further in prayer and came back to check on the disciples. And he found them, the text said, sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch for one hour? Simon, watch and pray unless you enter into temptation. For the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh, my brother, is weak. Class, it's interesting when we arrive at this particular pericope in the text.
that after pouring out his heart in prayer, Jesus gets up, takes a break, and goes to see where the other disciples are. Notice this. In his suffering, his mind is on his disciples, and at the same time, it's on his dilemma. Did you catch it? Have you ever been there? Have you ever had a heavy heart for what you were going through, but yet had to care for others at the same time? Have you ever had to pray about a situation and then get up and check on a situation? Huh? Have you ever had to look up and then look out to see if things had changed in the lives of others? Listen, Jesus is praying and watching for himself and others to see what God the Father was going to do. And the Bible says, he found them sleeping, Lord Jesus. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you, out of all of these 11, not watch one hour? Beloved, when we come to this text, we see that when Jesus arrives at Simon's location, he finds him in submission to the flesh. Did you catch it? He, he, he comes and he finds them inattentive to the master's sorrow. When he comes, he finds them without concern for the master's dilemma. When he comes, he finds them doing what makes them feel good. Let me say it another way. When he comes, he finds them comforting the flesh. When he comes, he finds sleepy disciples. Can I park the car right there, class? This is a good place to ask, what's wrong with the church today? Could it be that God has trusted us to pray and watch, but we are fast asleep? Could it be that we were entrusted with spiritual things, but we are inattentive to the master's sorrow or the things that break his heart? Could it be that when he comes, he will find us like these disciples, comforting our flesh? Could it be that when he comes, he will find us like these, doing what makes them feel good? Oh, my beloved sisters, brothers, little flock of God, I cannot help but notice that Gethsemane has breaking points for everybody. Y'all gonna help me tonight? Look, in Gethsemane, no man is without a vice. Huh? In Gethsemane, the one who said, I will be with you and I'll never leave you will sleep on you. In Gethsemane, the one who should be watching can become easily distracted. In Gethsemane, the hardships of life will break a man's will. In Gethsemane, you'll forget about what you said you would do. In Gethsemane, you'll discover the place where the flesh is crushed under the weight of sorrows. Let's see if I can make it live this way. Could you not watch one hour? Couldn't you keep your eyes open, Simon, in support of my sorrow? Couldn't you keep up with my intercession? Couldn't you keep up with my date with destiny? Couldn't you see what I was telling you? Simon, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Because I'm telling you, Peter, the spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak. Beloved, I observe here in the text that Christ is encouraging Peter and the others to wake up and pray. Why? So the enemy will not tempt them while they're in Gethsemane. Catch it? This encouragement 
it comes at a time when these brothers will need it most. See, they will need to avoid the satanic subtle trap of self-sufficiency in order to endure what's about to come. Here it is, class. The encouragement from Christ will help them in the future if they listen when they have to travel this way again. So he's trying to warn them how to avoid entering temptation in the Gethsemanes of life. Look at the words he used. Watch, Gregorio in the Greek word. It means to stay awake, be vigilant, shake oneself, be woke, be on point, pay attention. And then he uses another verb. He says, pray, proskumai. It, it means to supplicate, to worship, right? Two verbs, watch, be vigilant, and pray, worship. In other words, in order to avoid falling into temptation of the flesh in Gethsemane, a Gethsemane situation, you got to be vigilant and watching, and you got to be on point in worship. Why? It will combat temptation from the Gethsemanes of life. I just dropped something right there. I hope y'all picking up what I'm putting down. If you want to avoid temptation in Gethsemane, you got to watch and you got to pray. Let me say it like this. Beloved, as we travel through our Gethsemane, we ought to remember, stay awake and pray. As we travel through our Gethsemane on earth, we ought to keep our eyes on Jesus. As we travel through our Gethsemanes, we ought to run the prayer and worship. Why? That's the key for avoiding temptation in that dark night of the soul. Well, I got to leave you now. Thank you, class, for watching. But the Bible says in verse 39, he went away and prayed again. And this time he spoke the same words to the father that he spoke before. And when he returned again, he found them asleep again. Why? Their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. Bible, the Bible says in verse 30, 41, that he came a third time, and he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Well, it's enough, for the hour has come. And behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. So rise, little flock, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Well, beloved, thank you for logging on tonight and listening to this window to look through. As we close this text class, Jesus goes and models for us now how to avoid the temptation of the flesh and how to avoid giving in to our own desires in the midst of the trial in Gethsemane. In other words, do what you see him do. Watch and pray. Pray and watch. Watch and pray. And pray and watch. Oh class, if Jesus could go back and pray some more, then you can keep going back and praying in the crisis. If Jesus could keep watching Gethsemane, then you and I can keep watch in Gethsemane. If Jesus had to worship in his Gethsemane, you and I got to worship in our Gethsemane. If this is how you avoid temptation in Gethsemane, then do what it takes to escape the works of the flesh. Last time I checked the text, the Bible said he came back a third time. 
and he found the disciples sleeping like they were before. Here's what I learned. When you fail to get the lessons of Gethsemane, you fail in Gethsemane. When you fail to listen to the word of the Lord, you fail to obey the word of the Lord. When you fail to watch and pray, then temptation can easily overtake you. Oh, class, because Jesus prayed in Gethsemane, he was prepared for what happened next. Because he worshiped in Gethsemane, he could now endure the remaining sorrows. Because he dialogued with Abba Father, he was ready for the enemy and able to walk through the darkest day of his humanity. The betrayal of Judas came, the false accusations of the jury, the divine judgment of the Father to redeem us from our sin. They all came. They all came to pass. But Jesus was prepared because he knew how to go through Gethsemane. Here it is again. If you're going to go through Gethsemane, you got to go through with a mind to pray. If you're going to go through Gethsemane, go through with the mentality to pray a little farther. If you're going to go through Gethsemane, you got to go taking others with you so they can learn too. Can I get an amen? Amen. Well, thank you, class, so much for logging on to this Bible class on tonight. I pray that this lesson has blessed you tremendously. I pray that the gospel of Mark will warm your hearts and minds and that you will keep your eyes on the Christ. This text, Mark chapter 14, is an incredible passage. We looked at verses 32 through 42. Let me close us now with a window to look through prayer. Let's pray, class. Our Father and our God, Oh, how we thank you on tonight for teaching us how to pray in the Gethsemane situations of life. Thank you, Lord, for modeling what it looks like to pray even in the midst of your sorrows, your suffering, and your sight, your, your, your setbacks, the blood that you shed. Thank you, Lord, for letting us see that. Thank you for teaching us to take others with us when we go to prayer and to intercede for our situations. Thank you, Lord, that you model that you too will be able to make it once you spend time watching and praying in the midst of that situation. Thank you that we can learn from your example because you watched and because you prayed, you were able to endure even the betrayal, the persecution, the cross, getting victory over the grave, and being raised back to life by the Father. Thank you, Lord. We love you for tonight. I pray for every believer on the line that, Lord, you will bless them to try this principle when their Gethsemane comes upon them too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you, class, so much. May the Lord bless you and keep you real good. Hey, have a great night, and we see you next week. If the Lord delays his coming. Peace.